So the message this morning is based on the epistle lesson for the day, which comes from 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. And that's 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we will know when he appears we will be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. So the title for the message is The Righteousness of the Unrighteous. We are righteous not by our actions or by what we do, but we are righteous because of Jesus Christ and what he did for us on the cross that invites us to come into his righteousness to be children of God. So when a child is born or an older child is looked at, there's often a discussion of which parent does it represent? Who does it look like? We look at facial features or hair color or the attitudes or the speech of the child or how tall they are or their build. And you might even hear statements like, it's just a chip off the old block or the apple doesn't fall very far from the tree. The implication being that children resemble their parents. Now, children are not clones of our parents. Although not identical to parents, children do have many features in common with their parents. I just recently saw a picture on Facebook uh, from 1920 when my dad was 10 years old, and I showed it to Emily, and she looked at it and says, how did you get in this old picture? Because my dad looked exactly the same as I did, or actually the other way around. I look exactly like my dad when I was 10 years old as he did in that 10 year old, when he was 10 years old in that picture. It was just a remarkable resemblance. And this is also one of the distinguishing features of us as children of God, that we would be like Jesus Christ, the Son of the Most High God. Now, physically, we won't look like Jesus, but, it, but we will have his features on a spiritual level. One mind, one heart, one spirit. And this is all through, with, will be one with the Father through Jesus Christ, all by the power of the Holy Spirit. And that we should be called children of God. That's what sets us apart from the rest of the world. And the world will see the difference that there is because we are children of God. So what is a child of God? Or who is a child of God, you might ask? A child of God is one who is loved by God. Now, God loves all people, so all people can be a child of God. 1 John chapter 4, verse 10 tells us, In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved, God, that he loved us and sent his Son to be a sacrifice for our sins. From this we see that God... Through his love is the initiator that has made, a way, has made the way for us to be children of God. So then who is a child of God? If all can be children of God, how is it that some are and some are not? John chapter 1 verse 12 gives us insight to answer that question. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. So the love of God is extended and reaches out to one and to all. It is, it is there for all that all can become children of God. It is up to us then to choose to either accept or to reject that invitation. To believe and accept the invitation into the family of God is to become a child of God. And this is not of our own working or effort, but it's the love and grace of God on our behalf that makes that possible. Now, to doubt and to reject God and his invitation 
into the family is to remain on the outside and to not become a child of God. But God does not stop loving those who reject him. He continues to love them and invite them to come in to the family. But he does not force anyone to do that. He loves us and makes the way, but it is up to us to receive and to believe. Now, as children of God, we live in a world that does not know us. And the reason they do not know us is because they did not know Jesus or his father who sent him. Have you ever noticed that when you are talking with someone about a topic that is exciting or important to you, how at first they will be connecting with you, they'll be very interested in what you are saying and be tracking, but then after a while, as you continue to share, they may seem less interested. They might even notice a little haze come over them or they're glazed over or not really be hearing you. You talk, but they are no longer interested. Hopefully that's not happening here this morning. And this is what the Apostle John is referring to in the second half of verse 1 for our lesson today. The world does not know him because the world does not know us because it did not know him. So when we talk about or share faith issues with ones that are not yet children of God or disciples of Jesus Christ, we soon get to that point where they are no longer interest or the conversation can't go any farther. There is a barrier that comes between us to the sharing. The listener might glaze over and will likely want to change the topic or the subject what we're listening or talking about to something that doesn't go as deep. You know, maybe talk about the weather or sports, a topic that doesn't tug at the heart level like talking about faith issues does. And this need not surprise us as the things of the Spirit are revealed by the Spirit of God. And if one is not yet a disciple of Jesus Christ, their personal spirit will be asleep and they'll be unable to interact with the Spirit of God within us. One who is not yet a disciple of Jesus Christ will not know or understand the things of God as they are revealed by the Holy Spirit. So does this mean that we should not talk about faith? Or we should not talk about spiritual matters with people who are not yet disciples of Christ? Definitely not. For how can they believe if they don't hear? And how can they hear if we don't share? However, the most loving thing for us to do is to share with them and be mindful of where they are at in the conversation. And when they lose interest, that's a good time to stop and to back off. And maybe at a later date, you or someone else will be able to share with them and go deeper at that time. We are to always be ready to share what Jesus has done in our life, the difference he has made in our life, to share our testimony, to share the basis for the hope that we have in eternal life with God in heaven. We share the Holy Spirit changes the heart. That's not our responsibility. We just share. We are blessed to be a blessing. Now, as children of God, there is more promised good news. God's not finished with us yet. Life here on earth is an ongoing process of transformation from one degree of glory to a greater degree of glory. And then there's heaven, the ultimate glory. As children of God, our eternal destination is already set in Christ. When Father God looks upon us, he sees us through the righteousness of Jesus Christ, his perfect sin-free son who gave his life that we might have life and have it to the fullest. Love that is greater than what we can dream or imagine. And when Jesus returns, as children, we shall be like him, because we shall see Jesus as he fully is now in heaven and forever shall be. And we can know this is true because this is the promise of verse 2 in our text for today. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, 
we will be like him because we shall see him as he is. Now the promises of God are true and will be fulfilled for God is faithful to his word. God has never broken one of his promises and he never will. So as a child of God, our eternal destination is determined here and now. And because God said so as a child of God, we will be like Jesus when he returns. So that leaves the time between now and when Jesus returns for us to be moving in the direction of Christ-likeness as children of God. And if I was to narrow that down even farther, because we don't really know when Jesus will return, we are looking at the time between today and our physical death or when Jesus returns, whichever one of those two comes first. So now is where we get to the application part of this text for today, as well as to this message. 1 John chapter 3, verse 3 says, And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. So what does it mean to be pure? To look at a dictionary definition of pure, it means to be free of contamination or unmixed or without alteration. To be free or to be pure is to be spotless or stainless. So by way of an example, pure water would be water that is without dirt or dust or chemicals. To be without anything foreign, even at the microscopic level. Or a musical tone is a single frequency without distortion. If I was to go over to the piano and hit the first A key above middle C, we'd have a frequency that is exactly 440 hertz. It wouldn't be 441 or 437, but it would be a pure tone at 440 hertz. So now if we're to apply that to the life of a disciple of Jesus Christ, which is another name for a child of God, means to be free of sin. Pure and free from sin, even as Jesus is free from sin. Now here on earth, we are in the process of being purified. We are in the process of becoming less sinful. Now, although we will not be fully purified here on earth, we can be moving in that direction. It's an ongoing process. So as a child of God, we seek to be purified and less sinful, not to be loved by God because we are already unconditionally loved by God, but we do that because we are loved by God. That is why we choose to live a sin-free life, why we choose to be obedient. Now, there is nothing that we can do to cause God to love us more, and there's nothing that we have done or will do that will cause God to love us less. As children of God, as disciples of Jesus Christ, we are already accepted and approved of and loved unconditionally. Now, some functions of the Holy Spirit are to remind us of everything that Jesus said and did, to convict us of our sin, and to empower us to live a more godly life. Now, the Holy Spirit reminds us of everything that Jesus said and did so that we can know right from wrong. The Holy Spirit communicates with our spirit, personal spirit to awaken our personal conscience to test and to see what is pure and what is not. And then he empowers us to make the right choice, gives us the strength to be, live that pure and holy life. And the Holy Spirit also convicts us of when we have sinned. Or to rephrase that in another way, the Holy Spirit brings to our conscious mind areas where we have sinned, and then he empowers us to repent of that sin, confess it, and be forgiven. And when we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we become a child of God, and we also receive the Holy Spirit. And it is that Holy Spirit that empowers us to live and ever be more like Jesus in all that we think, say, and do. Jesus is pure and holy. To be holy means to be set apart unto God and the purposes of God. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 16 tells us or invites us 
You shall be holy, for I am holy. In this, God is inviting us to come away from the things of the world, the things of this world that would distract us or tempt us to settle for less than what God has for us. And what God has for us is always the best. Now, when God says to us, be holy as I am holy, he is not threatening us and he's certainly not scolding us. But rather God is, through the Holy Spirit, is cheering us on like a loving parent or that a coach or a friend to inspire us to move forward into the richer and greater life that he has for us, to greater victory in all that we do. Living a life moving in the direction of greater purity is about obedience and intimacy with God the Father, who loves us more than we will ever fully understand here on earth. A father who welcomes us into his presence. A father who enjoys spending time with us. A father who is always in a good mood. Do you know that father? He knows you. And he is inviting you to that greater life. So I encourage you to accept that invitation today whether that be to become a child of God or to grow in intimacy with him and live in greater purity as that child of God. That is his desire for each and every one of us. Please bow your hearts and pray with me. Lord Jesus, thank you for loving us. Thank you, Father God, for loving us so much that you didn't just tell us that, but you demonstrated that love for us, that while we're still sinners, your son, Jesus Christ, gave his life that we might have life and have it to the fullest. Stir in us a greater intimacy and wholeness, Lord. Help us to come into that place of greater victory as children of God, children of a loving Father, and Lord, anywhere where there's barriers or obstacles for us to see ourselves as you see us, Lord, I pray for a removal of that. If there's a sin that needs to be confessed, show us what that is and give us the strength to let that go. If there is a habit in our life that is hindering our walk with you, Lord, give us the strength to turn away from that, to repent of that. And Lord, thank you for blessing us. Thank you for enriching our lives with your word, with your spirit, your power. Fill us with your Holy Spirit now as we go forth from this place. And Lord, as a congregation, Father, I pray that, that you would stir in us a heart for worship, a heart to walk with you, a heart to let the, heart, the light of Christ within us shine forward to bless those around us whether that be in our homes or our schools, where we work, where we play, or where we shop, wherever we go, Lord, that people would see the difference that you make in us and uh, want to know what that is. They want to have that, that you, Lord God, would be glorified, that you would be high and lifted up. Thank you, Lord. And Father, I pray too for this congregation and for the call committee as uh, we are seeking your desire for this congregation for a senior pastor. Lord, I pray for an increase of the gift of discernment to clearly hear and know your plans for us for this time and this place. Thank you for this congregation and their love for you and for your word. Lord, I pray for healing within the congregation, physical, spiritual, and emotional healing. Lord, that each would know that you are the answer that you gave your life on the cross to conquer sin and death and sickness. Lord, I pray that that would be released and appropriated into the minds, the hearts, and the bodies of all who call this church home and all in their sphere of influence. Lord, we pray this in your holy name, Lord God. So I'd invite you now to join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory now ever and ever.